Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here, welcome back to the channel and today is a miracle because we are in the middle of the rainy season here in Japan but even though we are also near the new moon, we're getting a clear night tonight so obviously I have to take advantage of that. I will be taking advantage of that with not this camera. I will be using this mount and this telescope but not this camera. We're gonna use something a little subversive for the camera and something that is absolutely not adapted to deep sky astrophotography and yet we'll make use of that on a target that is M101, the uh, galaxy that currently has a supernova in it because it's all a lot of fun. Okay, so why am I doing that? Because I've already taken an image of this galaxy not so long ago. I put it on a video in the channel sometime. So what's, uh, what's the objective there? Well, let me first explain what's the camera that I'm getting. I am getting the QHY53715C uh, camera. And as you can see, it is a super speed planetary slash guiding camera. And so it is absolutely not a deep sky camera, but we're still going to be using it for deep sky. So this is not a review of this camera. This camera was provided to me on loan by uh, QHY after I contacted them and said like, hey, could you, could you let me test this camera because I want to try it out for deep sky astrophotography? To which we, the answer was, it's not going to work. <laughs> You're not going to get good results. Are you out of your mind? But we'll lend it out to you anyway. So here we are. Thank you, QHY, for taking a bet like that. And I'm very, very sorry about this. Um, yes, yeah, so it's on loan. I did not have to pay for it, but I'll have to return it. And as I understand it, I'll have to pay the shipping to return it to QHY. So yeah. So what is so special about this camera? The camera is very special because while it has a very small sensor, the sensor has 1.45 micrometer uh, wide pixels or large pixels, which means that the pixels are super extremely tiny. Most of the cameras that we use these days for deep sky have around 3.7 uh, micrometer size pixels. Uh, so this is like the side of the pixel is even less than half of the size of the pixels in this camera, which means that you can achieve a higher resolution for the same setup because you're getting smaller pixels. Now, smaller pixels, they have a slew of disadvantages. They're typically more sensitive to noise. And of course, the surface area of an individual pixel is smaller. And therefore, your per pixel uh, signal to noise ratio for the same exposure time will suffer. But you get more resolution. But wait, you may ask, like, what is the point of using such tiny pixels for deep sky astrophotography if you are anyway lim limited by the uh, wave nature of light? I have a maximum resolution for my telescope that it can achieve due to the wave nature of light. And also you are limited by the atmosphere and the atmospheric seeing, how the atmosphere with its movements blurs out the images that come from outer space. And that is a very good point. So how are we going to deal with that? two things. We are going to take short exposures. I'm going to start with 10 second exposures. And also we are going to be using a competent deconvolution algorithm using Blur Exterminator, which we've had good success with, with dithering and drizzling on this camera. Anyway, let's uh, open this box and see what's inside. Oops. We have an instruction manual, which I will not open. We have some nice foam and then we have the camera. The camera is beautiful. I like really the blue color that it has. Uh, and with this, there's like an adjustment ring so you can uh, choose how deep the camera will go in inside a, a 1.25 eyepiece cube. And you have a really, really nice feeling USB-C cable uh, together with an ST4 guiding cable, which you should never use. You should be using ASCOM drive guiding instead if you have a go-to mount. There's a few other adapters. I'm not so sure what they do. We're not going to use them. We're just going to use the camera as is. One of the things that I noticed with the camera, I wasn't so sure about like the uh, the USB-C kind of plug on an Astro camera because I felt the, uh, the the cable could like slip off very easily, but it's actually super well in place. It's like, um, like pretty well designed. So well done, QHY for that. Uh, and let's have a look at the sensor. The sensor is tiny, but it has tiny pixels inside. And you can see from the reflection, there's the window on front in front of the sensor is a UV IR cut window. So I will not have to use any additional filter. 
Obviously, the camera is uncooled, which is going to be a big issue because these days in Tokyo today, the uh, weather forecast is for 33 to 34 degrees Celsius. So that's going to be really, really warm. And when I'll be comparing the images that I take with this camera on M101 and the images that I took with that camera on M101, uh, keep in mind that the temperature for that camera was minus five degrees Celsius. This one will be uh, in excess probably of uh, 35 degrees. So yeah, keep it, keep that in mind. We'll have much more thermal noise here. We have another obstacle to using this camera in this season because M101, when we reach astronomical darkness is now way past the meridian. So we're not in the best imaging conditions. It's already getting lower and lower into the uh, Tokyo light pollution. Add to that, that because it's going to be a very hot day, we tend to have like the smog staying within like the Tokyo metropolis kind of thing. We typically have also a, a nightly inversion that really keeps the, uh, the air and the smog in place. So we have multiple disadvantages to using that. I expect to get very poor signal to noise ratio, but what we'll be looking at is the details. Obviously, again, this camera is made for planetary and the big advantage of planetary with this is you have tiny pixels. Planets are bright, so those planet, tiny pixels, they don't really care about noise or anything like that. And it means that with a telescope like this one or like one of those smaller focal length telescope, you can achieve high definition planetary imaging. If you want like a more full review of the camera in a use case that is a bit more typical, but still subverted a little bit, I'll also put a link down in the description, maybe up above as well, to Dylan O'Donnell's review of this particular camera. Oh, and uh, something I forgot to mention about the camera, it is 200 US dollars. So it is fairly cheap, even for a planetary camera. It is high speed. It has 512 megs of uh, DDR3 buffer, which is great when you're doing like, uh, high speed video imaging of planets. But of course, all of that for us is going to be irrelevant today. Still, I like that the price is relatively low, especially these days with inflation. Let's get it installed. So to get it installed, it fits into 1.25 uh, inch eyepiece kind of uh, holder. So I'll just be using that and, uh, and then replacing it on my coma corrector. And here we have the camera in place on my Newtonian telescope. So for a focal length of roughly 517 millimeters, but coupled with those amazing pixels of a size pixel pitch of 1.45 micrometers. So we are absolutely oversampled to the extreme, but there is indeed a rhyme to this madness because as we've seen with the drizzling, uh, dizzering plus drizzling, followed by a competent deconvolution algorithm like uh, Blur Exterminator, we can get amazing results. So will the additional resolution afforded to me by this little camera help me get better results than uh, what I had just a month earlier when I imaged the supernova in M101? Well, we shall see. Now, obviously, this is the whole setup. Uh, that I will be using for imaging. We'll be taking, yeah, probably 10 second exposures. And I have the AM5 mount is going to be driving this. Hopefully it's decently polar aligned. I will double check this, but even for 10 seconds exposure, even if you have like a slight polar misalignment, this can become a problem with those super tiny pixels. So we might not get the best possible results. We'll see. One of the issues that I have is because I'm on a wooden slab on this rooftop balcony. Uh, when I polar align, the alignment might be perfect, but as I stand up, the wood springs back to, the, to, to its original shape and I misaligned again. So that might be an issue. Okay, with that, let's wait for nightfall and let's get to imaging. We're currently imaging. There's autofocus running right now uh, due to a spike that we had here. And what's very interesting, if you look at this chart, there is of HFR, half loss radius, so basically the size of the stars and the number of the stars at the top, there's this big spike here. And any idea what that is? That was an earthquake. <laughs> there was a small earthquake that I felt. And just as I felt it, I saw my frames were getting weird. So my frames are 10 seconds long each. And uh, what can we see about them? And I'm dithering every six frames. So every minute, effectively, 10 second exposures. And I'm also every minute checking the uh, center after drift to make sure that my 
dithering um, does not like move the target away because if we look at the equipment as the guider i'm using direct guider uh, so that means that i'm dithering directly without having to use an actual guide scope right so we i'm just doing lucky imaging and we've started imaging again the uh, autofocus run is over so here we are this is super cool we don't see anything really on each frame we'll see what results we, we get in the end it's going to be very interesting but i like this it's it's kind of fun so fingers crossed Let's see what happens. And we managed to image M101 with that tiny planetary camera. And I managed to get 1,200 exposures of 10 seconds each. Uh, and I did it unguided, right? So that I could simply dither every like minute or two minutes, something like that. And I didn't need to have like the, the guiding going on and the dithering eating up too much of my imaging time. So, so really no guiding, blind dithering and hopefully it went okay, we're gonna see. I expect to have like some uh, tracking issues because of the polar alignment kind of uh, issue that I have on my rooftop uh, that I mentioned earlier, but we'll see. So uh, on my screen, I have two results. The result on the left is the one with the planetary camera. The result on the right is the one one month ago from uh, my uh, IMX 571, so APS-C size, cooled astrophotography camera from Taupe Tech. As always, all of the links are going to be in the description if you're interested in checking out or buying any of this equipment. And obviously the first thing that we can see is that my image from the cooled camera has a much better signal to noise ratio. As I mentioned earlier in the video, it has multiple advantages in that I was able to image close to the meridian, like around the meridian, even most of the image, imaging time was there. The camera was cooled to minus five degrees. And also the image on the right has more exposure time, something like 50% more exposure time in total. So obviously we get better signal to noise ratio. The image on the left, well, it's less signal to noise ratio, very obviously, but don't like, I don't know if it shows, translates well on YouTube, but just like looking at those two images, I can tell that the image on the right looks a bit blurrier, which makes sense because it was made with uh, bigger pixels. Now the image on the, on the right to really compare, to really try to give my IMX 571 the best chance possible against the tiny pixels of the QHY on the left, I drizzled the image on the right. So the image on the right is drizzled two times, which basically makes almost an equivalent pixel size between the two. And then we're going to be uh, applying blur exterminator with the default settings on both images and see what happens. So uh, up to now, there's only been dynamic background extraction and color calibration on both images, nothing else uh, at all. So let's zoom in a little bit on the images and uh, like, let's look around the supernova. So the image on the right, which was taken with the cooled IMX 571 camera on the same telescope, we can see that there are some details here, but if we have the same field of view, you can see we have like the details are much more uh, separate. We have like three dots here rather than like a continuous type of line. We get more details. There's multiple reasons for that. There's of course the smaller pixels, but there's also the shorter exposures uh, because 10 seconds will do better against seeing than I think it was 60 seconds or 120 seconds on the right. We can also see that on, that on both images my tracking wasn't perfect or my focus wasn't perfect, or my collimation wasn't perfect. Either one of these, you never know these days. Already, I can see more details in the image on the left. Let's check like this, this like uh, blobs on the uh, on this area. So we can see the same thing. So the image on the right looks more blurry than the image on the left. Again, whether it's the atmosphere or the smaller pixels, we don't know. Um, it's, I think it's very interesting. And let's look at the core of the galaxy here a little bit. And I think we can see the, the same type of thing. The noise is much more better controlled on the right hand side, but on the left hand side, I think I can see more details. It's sharper. It's less blurry. We can see like two lanes of light here that are almost indistinguishable on this image. 
it's a big difference and it's very interesting. Obviously, because I used my planetary camera on the left hand side, I had to take like my darks and flats and dark flats, all of those nice calibration frames that are much more painful to take than the cooled camera on the right, but I'm still getting better results, at least in terms of details. Okay, well, let's apply Blur Exterminator on both images and see whether we can get them, again, looking equivalent to one another, or whether, in terms of the, res the resolution, the planetary camera from QHY will give a better result. Okay, we've applied Blur Exterminator, and both images look sharp, but I think the image on the right, which is the cooled camera image with the larger pixels, uh, had a bigger improvement than the image on the left, and I do believe it's thanks to the drizzling that we were able to uh, achieve that. Uh, but let's, let's have a look at the same areas. Do I see more details? Yes. Like this is no longer just a line, we can see kind of a blob here. What if we look at the planetary cam- oh yeah, no, it's not even the same. Like we still get better resolution, better uh, contrast, better separation between those features on my planetary cam camera than I get on my cooled camera. This is so much fun, <laughs> this is so cool. Let's look at this, this blob here. And same story, the, the image on the right with the cold camera looks blurrier than the image on the left where we have more definition, more resolution, more details. <laughs> this is so fun. Let's have a look at the core of the galaxy. And the core of the galaxy, the, the story is the same. There is better signal to noise ratio and contrast on those lanes here on the left compared to the planetary camera. But if you look at the core, you see like this kind of zigzag here that goes towards the core. It's, it's not visible on the IMX571 image. Uh, you have like almost like a little line here that comes out. It's not visible there. You have like the C shape of the core itself that looks sharper on the planetary camera on the left than it does on the cold camera on the right. And if I look at another area of the galaxy, the same story again, we see simply much more details on the tiny pixels camera. And you know, you could say that's expected, but because I have terrible in seeing in Tokyo, my atmosphere here is terrible. And I'm already like with the tiny pixels on the left hand side, I'm already past the DAWs limit of my telescope. I wasn't expecting to see such a difference, but we do. Uh, in, even before Blur Exterminator we did, but after Blur Exterminator, it's like still very, very visible in terms of how much more details I can get. Like, look at this, we can see three dots on the left, but it's like just a blur on the right. So obviously there are probably other causes, the longer exposures on the right hand side compared to the left hand side. There could be like differences in seeing between the two days. Uh, there's lots of factors that could account for that. But I still find this very interesting. You know, it, it really highlights a point that I think we've been missing recently. We don't really have a good deep sky object uh, cooled astrophotography camera. The only one that comes to mind for me is the 183 cameras, the, the cameras with the IMX 183 sensor. They have 2.4 micrometer pixel size, which is good. It's actually a great compromise, but it's an older sensor. It has the amp glow. It doesn't have like all the nice tech that the IMX 571 does, for instance. And so I'm waiting to see a good successor to the 183 sensor for deep sky without any amp glow with like that's very easy to deal with because that's something that could be really nice to have. So QHY, like that little uh, 715 sensor, it's pretty neat, right? It's, it's, it's good for galaxies when you're using a small Newtonian or Hyperstar or Raza and um, it's good for planetary nebulae as well. Uh, so could you make a little uh, cooled uh, version? Mm? Um, thank you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what do you think of this? Like, what are your thoughts on this? Do you feel like you want to use this little tiny sensor with tiny pixels for deep sky just for the fun of it? And to give more background, one of my Patreon supporters and subscribers, uh, Dave Huff, has actually been using this little planetary camera for deep space as well. I'll put a link to his Astrobin in the description so you can see the images that he's been achieving with Raza 8, I believe, together with this camera. 
now to get like more resolution compared to a standard IMX 571 sensor. I think it's very interesting and it kind of pushes the envelope and this is all thanks to technologies like Blur Exterminator that can help us counter the, uh, the blurring that we get into our images from the point spread function. And if we get like a, a cooled camera that with tiny pixels that can take like five second exposures because it's sensitive enough and and we can go unguided like that all night long and then stack them maybe not even in PixInsight anymore but maybe in like auto stackers or planetary kind of stacking algorithms to do lucky imaging for deep sky things could get amazing really really fast so could be a really good thing to look into so QHY others look into it. Again, please leave your comments in the description, by the way, since I'll have to ship the camera back. That's going to be a little bit of an expense again. And thank you to my Patreon supporters for supporting me and helping me do all of that and covering the expenses I have running the channel. Thank you also for my YouTube, to my YouTube members as well for the same purpose. And of course, thank you to all of my viewers, all of my subscribers, everyone who interacts with the videos, likes or dislikes or comments on them. It truly, truly helps the channel out. Uh, so if you want to help, go down below, leave a comment, leave a like, tell us what you think. And more important than all of that, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.